Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redman, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And, of course, you can listen to the show later on on uh, Friday nights. We're on a host of other stations. Uh, we're also on Saturday nights on KYAH, uh, 540 a.m. out in Utah. Uh, very excited about that. And uh, and hopefully on the horizon we'll, we'll be adding uh, uh, some more uh, ways to listen to the show. Of course, you can find me on iTunes and Stitcher, TuneIn, of course, on YouTube, and uh, and always uh, you know through RSS feed and on my website. Uh, so uh, very, very excited about today's show. I, I've got to say, I probably have the biggest guest I've ever had on the show, and also a uh, well, two of the biggest guests I've ever had on the show, really. Uh, and uh, we are, uh, I don't want to waste uh, too much time babbling about myself and whatnot. Uh, just quickly to uh, thank everybody on Patreon uh, who has been donating to the show. I know that there are uh, some silly changes going on over at Patreon, and I'm going to I'm gonna be recording something and addressing that. I know some people have had some concerns. It's not really as big a deal as uh, some people are making it out to be, I don't think. But anyway, without further ado, I want to uh, introduce, of course, a, a friend of the show and a return guest. Pat McKenna, private investigator, who has uh, worked on uh, numerous cases, and uh, we always have Pat on to talk about O.J. Simpson. And joining uh, Pat as well for this discussion is a living legend, Ethley Bailey, uh, famous, uh, you know, legendary defense attorney. Uh, Lee has worked on uh, all sorts of cases, of course, the uh, Boston Strangler, Patty Hearst, and uh, perhaps most famously, and uh, why we're going to be talking to him today, on the O.J. Simpson case. So, uh, Pat and Lee, how are you? Very good. I'm fine, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, uh, Lee, you know, uh, just uh, you're new to the to to the show, and uh, I mean, I'm assuming all my listeners know who you are, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Who is Ethley Bailey? Um, a pretty ordinary fellow who dropped out of Harvard in the Korean War to put his two cents of effort in, wound up in naval flight training, transitioned to the Marine Corps. Marine Corps ran out of lawyers, so they ordered me to be one without so much as a college degree. I obeyed orders like all good Marines and found out I kind of liked it. So when my tour was up, after four years as a fighter pilot, I went to, I enrolled in law school. I didn't go much. Indeed, I have the worst attendance record in the history of the Boston University Law School. And the dean used to call me in on a regular basis and say, you know, you're on the GI Bill, and if you weren't the valedictorian, we'd throw you out. <laughs> but uh, I managed to get a degree and walked into, a couple of months later, a capital case, one of the last to be tried in Massachusetts because the defense lawyer had a heart attack to us, and they needed a lawyer that knew something about polygraph testing. There were only two lawyers in the country who really knew anything about it. And the other one was from Alabama, and he'd just been appointed judge. So the defense was stuck with a 27-year-old uh, feisty Marine who was just out of law school and just passed the bar. And like the wise men of old, they were sore afraid. If I had lost that case, I think I would have wound up in medicine instead. Unfortunately, the jury agreed with me at about 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, we got an acquittal. My mother went to church the next morning. She was beaming. Her son was all over the news. But one of the uh, older spinster ladies came up to her and said, Well, Grace, I see that Lee was in the news. She said, Oh, yes. He won a murder. <laughs> and she said, Well, I suppose when you're starting out, you have to take what you can get. <laughs> So I continue uh, on, and the rest is written in the books here and there. 
Oh, absolutely. And like I said, I think everybody uh, should know who you are. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to get uh, the two of you on again to uh, uh, talk about the O.J. Simpson case, which is something I have been uh, obviously I've been covering here on the show for quite some time. And, you know, I've had uh, Pat on the show. I've had Stephen Singular. I've had Brian Heiss on many times. But I wanted to get uh, both of you, um, because you were actually involved in the case, of course, and you have a, a very unique perspective on all of this. And before we kind of jump into uh, uh, some of the more complex topics I wanted to get into today, I just wanted to get uh, the, the two of you, your, your take on uh, some of the recent media reports uh, that are, are coming out, um, mostly in the, the sort of cheesy tabloid media like TMZ and things like that. Uh, but what what do you make of this? Because it it seems sort of like uh, they're making uh, not making stories up necessarily. Although I have my suspicions. But what do you make of the, these sort of uh, you know little pieces that pop up? You know about how horrible OJ is and stuff like that. And and what's your uh, I definitely like to get your take on this, Lee? What's your take on Malcolm Laverne, his current lawyer? Um, Malcolm has done a good job for him. I had dinner a couple weeks ago. Um, actually October, with Malcolm and O.J., who was the same good old fellow I knew all during the trial and thereafter. And I think he's coping very well. The stories are vicious. One story had him um, kicked out of a restaurant, Cosmopolitan, I think, for having had too much to drink. Uh, he had had nothing to drink. It was strictly a setup to try and embarrass him, and having been in the news and unfavorably reported as much as he has, I'm afraid he's going to have to put up with that for a while. Now, the saving grace is America generally has the attention span of a four-year-old. Yes. So now that OJ is out, things will die down a bit. Maybe. Pat McKenna and I are here to see they don't die down much. We're writing a book about OJ which would be the first one, well, um, one of the first ones that are not pure fiction, because most of what's been written is garbage, has little to do with the real facts, and if the real facts didn't fit the author's fancy, he changed them. Or, as the Trump administration has pointed out, there is a certain grace in alternative news. <laughs> No, uh, certainly, and um, I think we'll, we're going to dive into uh, you know some of this uh, I don't know phenomenon with people in, in terms of uh, alternative facts and whatnot. And I definitely want to get uh, to your book a little bit later in the show. Um, Pat, any 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 brief sort of uh, thoughts on these uh, recent news stories? I mean, you and I have kind of talked about this before. I mean, they kind of come and they they make a splash, uh, like you said, Lee, for you know about I don't know twenty minutes, and then everyone kind of forgets it. Any any anything you want to say on that? Well, just all the while I was out there, I met a whole lot of reporters and journalists. And um, what what seemed to happen to me anyway, my observation was not these. It was the corporate media that started to see how much money was being made with getting stories out, whether they're right or wrong. Just get them first. I mean, and in stuff I've done with Brian, we talk about the various murder weapons and the stuff that was in major newspapers, Chicago Sun-Times, Tribune, all these uh, writers with sources, uh, remember the E-Tool and all that sort of stuff. So it's just, to me, I know a lot of reporters that are still in the business, and I also know a lot of good reporters that left the business uh, because they don't care about long-form, when I say they, the corporate world doesn't care so much about long-form journalism. They care about clickbaits and what the Kardashian, what they're doing and stuff <laughs> like that. That evidently uh, is what what drives sales f for them. But uh, what I've seen recently, like the Vanity Fair, which I read a lot, they produced a story about OJ, <clears throat> excuse me, in this incident in the, in the uh, where he, quote, was thrown out of a bar. OJ Simpson carries his own breathalyzer. <clears throat> I've spoken to him. I was a parole officer. He can't have more than one drink. He can have a drink. Yeah, he has to have more than one. He has one drink every day because a parole officer can walk in that bar and take his blood and search his house and whatever they want to do. And they're itching to put him back in. Not not the Nevada folks, but society is itching to see him stumble and and fall and be back in jail, including some members of the media. I might point out with all due respect, 
And mm. I would also like to point out, by way of uh, an expression of gratitude, that Pat and I have been enabled to visit with you today from the law offices of John Romano, who is one of the top in the country for most anything that ails you. Well, uh, well, thank you, John, for uh, for uh, helping to uh, put this all together. And uh, just uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll just say in regards to this thing with OJ getting thrown out of the Cosmopolitan Hotel, I, just for anybody that, that wants to buy into this nonsense, keep in mind that the, the Las Vegas shooter, Stephen Paddock, slipped and fell and tried to sue the Cosmopolitan Hotel years ago. And, and in the aftermath of this, this horrible uh, massacre, that footage was out on every you know news channel uh, all over the world of this guy slipping and falling. Uh, and yet there's no footage from inside a, you know, a, a hotel casino in Las Vegas of OJ being thrown out of a bar. So ask yourself, I mean, where, where the footage is. But let's get to some, uh, to s some more meaty uh, sort of stuff here. And um, we're, we're going to be kind of uh, talking about some stuff that Brian uh, has been working on, who, uh, you know, I know all three of us are big fans of the work Brian does. And I want to get your your take on uh, something that he he posted uh, recently. It's an amazing article talking about the, uh, the infamous Nicole Simpson diary entries. And we're going to be focusing on one particular entry, uh, which was used later in the uh, Ron Goldman's wrongful death civil suit. Uh, that is almost certainly, or it is, a forgery. And this is an entry that was written four days before the murder, uh, where Nicole writes about OJ saying, you know, quote, you hung up on me last night, you're going to pay for this expletive. Uh, and this, of course, would reinforce the narrative that the murders were a result of the escalating domestic violence between the two of them. And uh, during the criminal trial, of course, none of the diary entries were deemed admissible. Uh, under the uh, uh, California criminal law, uh, and this is you know this has to do with hearsay laws and whatnot. And Judge Ito actually held a hearing on the defense motion seeking to bar evidence about the abuse. And the prosecution, in fact, wrote out an 85, uh, 85 page document listing all sorts of allegations. I think it was fifty allegations of abuse, uh, and they included some portions from. Nicole's diaries, but interestingly, this very um, sensational entry, which has now surfaced in Radar Online, so you know you can tell how uh, important this is, um, was not included. And it, what's significant about this entry is that it was supposedly written four days before the murder, but again, not included uh, in the original criminal case. And again, the first mention of this entry comes from the National Enquirer, who published the uh, diary entries, and they. Uh, got them from a, a quote-unquote concerned citizen. But more important in these entries is that Nicole talks about Sidney and Justin sleeping at OJ's house on Friday, May 27, 1994, and OJ bringing the kids back to Nicole's on Saturday, May 28, 1994. But as it turns out, Brian has been able to figure out that OJ was not even in L.A., during that weekend, okay, he was in Palm Springs with Paula Barbareri for the Memorial Day weekend, and this is chronicled in her book. She writes about this uh, all the time. In that diary entry, there's also a reference to an IRS letter, which Nicole didn't receive until June 6th, okay, three days after she supposedly wrote this uh, entry. So this is, a, a, I would say, a pretty huge uh, deal, because this appears to be a forgery that was then uh, allowed to stand in civil trial. Uh, and this is in part because Ronald Goldman lobbied California in order to change the hearsay laws. And it was sort of fast-tracked so that this could be included. And, um, I mean, guys, am I, am I wrong on this? Or is this like a huge this – this should be a huge story as opposed to O.J. Uh, you, know, uh, pretend, you know, allegedly being thrown out of a bar – uh, so, what do you make of Brian's research into this and what it really means? Well, I thought it was pretty, pretty interesting research. I didn't follow that part of the civil case with the diary, mm. but we've been dealing with perjury and forgery through both cases. Okay, um, starting with Mark Furman, and um, this stuff. We have the the diary from Discovery that we got from the DA, from Marcia Clark and Chris Darden. That wasn't in the one that we got. So either they kept it out, and why they would keep that out, that's more inflammatory than the crap they put in there in that 85-page motion, which, by the way, I think we had less than a week. It 
was around Thanksgiving or maybe right before Christmas that they threw that out there. And most of that was based on Faye Resnick's book. book. Um, and so much of it was blown away. They had a guy named Eddie Reynoso claim that Ron Goldman or he, OJ told them on some movie that they were on together that if he ever saw Ron Goldman driving Nicole's Ferrari, he would slit the throat. That's in the motion. Eddie Ray knows as a guy that popped up in Michael Jackson's case. He wasn't even in the movie as an extra or anything with, in those OJ movies. So we dealt with a lot of that stuff. We dealt with uh, specifics. Uh, the sister, uh, Denise, would say something uh, that she was with uh, Ed McCabe and uh, the fellow from the Seattle Seahawks, uh, a good friend of OJ's from Buffalo, uh, the, the blocker. I uh, can't think of his Alan name. Alan No. The uh, lineman. Uh, and so there would be like four people at this restaurant in Dana Point or somewhere, forget the specifics, saying that OJ threw her out of the car while it was running. Well, then you go to these. Reggie McKenzie was the guy. So Reggie McKenzie evidently is there. And I think a guy named McCabe. I may have some of these stories mixed up because they were all so crazy. But you, we would then go to these people. And Reggie, for example, would say, is she out of her mind? I was there that night. But. Certainly, we all went in, we had dinner, we came back out, we went our separate ways, but there was never a time when I'm in a car that O.J. Simpson threw Nicole out of a moving car. So most of that stuff was put out for shock value, and it was come off of Faye's book because, frankly, they didn't have a, a, a case all the way to December. They've got to say O.J.'s a violent, raging, wife-beating lunatic who, who escalated to a double murderer. And forget all the stuff that they already knew about, which was the timeline, which we go into in our book pretty well. Uh, and so it, to me, this, this new thing with the diary is just it's forgery and it matches real, real, real nicely with the perjury that we dealt with. And uh, frankly, I don't give it much. Uh, thought. It's great, great work by Brian, but it doesn't surprise me that uh, Nicole's diary, which was purchased by the National Enquirer for one hundred thousand dollars. I think Bob Baker got a settlement against the Enquirer in, or not Bob Baker, uh, a guy named Wayne Hughes was uh, the legal guardian for Sidney and Justin. And he was able to secure some of that money that I think it was Denise Brown uh, sent this part of the, the thing to the Enquirer for a hundred grand. Uh, but that part, like you say, the, the IRS letter wasn't even delivered to Nicole a couple days after this this diary entry. So it makes no sense that she would know ahead of time that she was getting an IRS letter. Uh, there's no phone records that OJ called her and said, oh, I'm, I forget the language that she's using. He didn't use that kind of language. He might have argued with her a lot, but the, the C word and all that stuff that's in that diary entry is complete BS. OJ never referred to Nicole in those terms. Let me mention something that is not BS. There's a screenplay afoot, which is partially funded to become a movie and is presently being uh, shot. Parts of it across the seas where <clears throat> the costs are much less. In the script, there is quoted a letter from Nicole who is telling someone that she's hearing stories that O.J. beat her up uh, chronically, and she said, that's all nonsense. So we got in a couple of scrapes, and I gave him as good as I got. And generally, he treats me like a queen. So, and I don't think we had that letter at the time. No, we, uh, not during our case. Well, but, you know, the, the big problem with the OJ case, really, I should split that there are two. First, I saw, and Pat saw, before we got tapes or anything else, that this was a simple case about a glove. When we got the tapes, Mark Furman had already said on tape, they'd like to throw me out of this case, but they can't do it because this is a case about a glove and I'm the only guy that can get the glove in evidence, which wasn't true, but he thought it was. He was dead right. If you take the glove out of the equation, no matter how much nonsense you publish about O.J. Simpson, you don't have a murder case, where, on the other hand, he's got three very substantial defenses. 
any one of which should have been a nuts for reasonable doubt. But the ironic thing is the jury bought defense number three, the strongest of the bunch, which was a timeline. That is an alibi patched together from various people being at different places, different times, but a continuum that simply shows Simpson couldn't have been there. That was the basis of the verdict. Most of the garbage we kept out of the criminal trial found its way into the civil trial, uh, where a judge who obviously liked the prosecution much better than the defense let it all in, including failing a lie detector test, which was just flat untrue. But the jury heard it. And so we now find that there are sources that think they have credibility that come out of the civil case like the Bruno Magli shoes picture, which the prosecutors in the criminal case had, found that they were doctored and didn't offer them in evidence. Those are the kinds of things that Pat and I and Bob Blazier, who's the only lawyer that sat through both trials, uh, are going to attempt to reconcile when uh, we get this book completed, which I know you'll want to talk about later. Mm. Well, and uh, I mean, again, this sort of goes to uh, the heart of a lot of the stuff we were talking, you know, that uh, I've talked about with you, Pat, and, and others about this case um, is, again, I mean, the the a the sort of selective, uh, I don't know, uh, ability for people to sort of uh, accept certain things and not accept other things. And there is this perception and, and Lee, maybe you could kind of talk to this as a lawyer. There's this perception uh, that, you know. Uh, everything that was allowed in the civil trial was, was you know, was stuff that, that you guys were covering up and that the civil trial is, is, is really the, the true trial of the two. Uh, when what's sort of avoided in a lot of that is, is, for instance, I mean, Ronald Goldman lobbying the California legislature to change their own laws to allow what is essentially hearsay testimony and evidence and allow that to be presented as completely truthful. And I think, you know, I know a lot of people view the civil trial as, uh, well, th this is the trial that got it right. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, what do you make of that? You mean, you mean Fred Goldman, not Ron Goldman. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Fred Goldman. Fred Goldman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, so, I mean, you know, what, what do you what do you make of this uh, as, as someone who's an expert in the law? Lee, I mean, th this th what's the problem with the, the sort of perception of the civil trial? Because, again, a lot of people sort of just assume, well, that's the one that got it right, because look at all this stuff that was like you said, the Bruno Mali shoes, e even though I mean, it, it's I mean, it, first off, there's no proof that he even owned the shoes. OK, and there's a lot of issues with those pictures as well. Um, they're not in jackets, yet it was pouring rain that day, and everyone had jackets. Why would you wear suede shoes in the rain? Uh, you know, but again, everyone says, oh, the shoes, the shoes, look at that. So uh, w just give us a sense of, uh, of, I mean, you know, what's the problem with the perception of the civil trial? Well, the problem is, and I'm sad to say this has pervaded the Hollywood community that produces films and TV shows. The problem is that people think that that was proof that O.J. killed Ronald Goldman. And Fred Goldman, who has been at stage center ever since his son got killed, and I take nothing from his bereavement and his grief, but he's made almost a Broadway production out of being Fred Goldman, including taking credit for passing that statute, which I think is ill-placed. This became a circus, despite a letter I wrote on the eve of trial saying, ladies and gentlemen, and you too, judge, this threatens to become a worse circus than I've ever been in, and I've been in a bunch. Let's try and keep enough ethics in the courtroom so that doesn't happen. And everybody agreed with me, and my warning was honored for 27 hours, and then it became a circus. It was... A terrible trial. It was a terrible example for the public to see of the conduct of lawyers and sometimes the judge who was in love with the dancing egos on the Jay Leno show to have to witness. And in other countries that I have traveled to before and since, the perception of American justice uh, has been widely ridiculed simply on the basis of the trial, including the fact that it was worth maybe three weeks 
of litigation with a good judge before, uh, uh, with two good lawyers before him in any state but California where all trials go at least four times the legitimate length. And uh, it has been so twisted and warped. Never in my life have I been punished more for getting an acquittal. Matter of fact, I don't recall ever being punished by the public. In this case, lawyers and judges have remonstrated with me for prostituting my talents because I was the reason they say that OJ got acquitted. And the phenomenon is something that has flowered now 20 some odd years later throughout the general population where divisiveness is not the exception, it's becoming the rule. It was flowering back then when that verdict came in. Uh, society just divided itself. In America, the white population heavily thought it was an outrage after they reflected for a day, and large segments, but not all, the black population thought it was wonderful, not because they loved O.J. Simpson, because they liked to see a racist cop go down. And here's a guy who pleaded guilty to perjury during the trial. Now, in most states, that carries as much as life imprisonment because the case was a murder case. As I recall, Mark Berman got a slap on the wrist, and then Dominic Dunn helped him write books and make money. Not a pretty ending. Mm. No, no, of course. And, and, and he's still sort of lionized. I mean, he's, he's a paid contributor on Fox News, of course, talking about police violence against uh, mostly black youths. Um, you know, as if he's some friggin' expert on this, um, but uh, and and I, I, you know I, I sort of echo what you were saying there. I mean, this sort of like slow decline into to circus nonsense with all of this. Um, uh, quickly back to the just uh, briefly on the diaries, and then I'll, I'll switch uh, gears a little bit. But do do you think um, again? It, Check out, you know, I encourage everybody to go to the show notes and, and read Brian's article. A, there's just factual mistakes in this particular entry. B, the handwriting, and I'm not a handwriting expert, but just looking at it, it looks like two different people. Okay, it doesn't really look like Nicole's handwriting. But given all of that, and this is speculative at best, but do you think Petra Kelly, the, this, this is the, the lawyer on the civil case, do you think he was aware of this? Or was it just sort of one of those things you you kind of look the other way? You sort of pretend like it's not uh, an issue. But do you think he was aware these entries were false? Well, he seemed more than willing to admit evidence which the criminal prosecutors knew to be false. That was the shoes. So I cannot conclude that uh, if Petrocelli had found that these were forgery, that would have inhibited them from offering him from offering them in evidence, and he did. Mm. And this, of course, then raises some serious questions about the the sort of uh, chain of custody of the diaries, how they were, you know, brought into the case, and also, I mean, was there anyone authenticating these beyond? I, I believe it was uh, Lou Brown that. Uh, quote unquote, you know, authenticated them and say, oh, yes, this is Nicole's diary. But I mean, things like that were I mean, clearly O.J. wasn't in L.A. at the time. You know, she's referencing uh, events that have not happened yet. You know, she's referencing an IRS letter that she's not going to get for three days later. I mean, was there just nobody in charge of, of fact checking this sort of stuff? Well, not really, um, as you can see, but don't. <laughs> To think this would have been important to Marsha Clark and Darden in the criminal case, uh, the shoes, for example. I mean, it's the first thing we, when we went out in July of 94, one of the first meetings I had was with Kathy Rando, Jay's secretary, and uh, Skip Taft, a lawyer uh, whose only client was OJ, and saying, we need every receipt for every shoe he's ever purchased because these shoe prints sound like they could be pretty big. And... Uh, they produced everything, and so the only conclusion you could draw would be that somewhere, somehow, Simpson slipped cash to a guy to give him those kind of shoes uh, years before. And, of course, it would be the first salesman on the planet that didn't get an autograph from O.J. to further corroborate that story. It was total BS. That shoe story was complete BS. They did an exhaustive search. They went to Italy to the Bruno Mali factory. They also – there's a, a knockoff. I think the name of the company is Lion, L-Y-O-N, that yeah. produced similar shoes. And uh, for all the work that Bodziak did, 
Nothing ever came back. They looked in Europe. OJ did the 92 uh, Olympics in Barcelona. They went everywhere. They tracked down every shoe through barcodes that ever come out of that factory. And not one of them ever went to OJ Simpson or to. Well, you know. we, we did find Bruno Magli's in his bedroom, but they were slippers. Yeah. He never had the shoes and the pictures don't prove he had the shoes. The pictures were doctored because Marsha Clark had them in our hands and decided not to offer them. The prosecution had taken a pretty good drubbing on screwing up the evidence, bad collection, bad preservation, bad technique. And they were getting hurt as an outfit that was incredibly sloppy and maybe not very smart. So she would not take a chance on trying to put these pictures in and have us put a couple of experts on the stand to slice and dice her and the prosecution team for knowingly using false evidence in a case. That alone, if you get jury resentment involved, as most trial lawyers know, that alone can govern the result of the case. When juries feel they're put upon that way, they say, okay, falsus in unum, falsus in omnibus. If you lie about one thing, you lie about everything. And we're just not going to give you a verdict no matter what you think your evidence shows. And Marcia was not the brightest lawyer I've ever met, but she wasn't dumb either. And she certainly was smart enough to know that would have been an awful bite in the backside if she offered them and they got caught. Oh, yeah. No, again, it, it, as sloppy as the, you know, uh, Darden and, and Clark were, like you said, I mean, they're not complete idiots. They there, There's a reason they didn't enter in a lot of stuff that uh, was entered in in the civil trial. And again, too, I mean, you, you're you have to keep in mind, too, that uh, I, it's my opinion that I mean, the the jurors in the civil trial wanted to convict him. You know, I mean, they they they, they felt like it was their civic duty to uh, quote unquote give justice to uh, Nicole Simpson and, and Ronald Goldman. So, you know, keep that in mind as well with uh, all of these sort of silly little things that uh, were, were included in that. Um, Lee, I, I think I would be, oh no, go ahead. I did that coin. You say they wanted to convict him. I believe that's true because the atmosphere in Santa Monica was totally poisonous. After the verdict came in, I who used to be the darling of invite him to dinner circuit throughout the trial suddenly could not get a glass of wine without paying for it. <laughs> Number two, the jurors in the civil case had watched the thrashing, the belittlement, and the insults that were heaped upon the jurors in the criminal case. And I haven't the slightest doubt, nor do any of the lawyers present, Bob Baker, uh, Dan Leonard, whom I trained years ago, and Bob Blazier, that this jury was not going to take a chance at being vilified for being duped by O.J. Simpson again, and that the verdict was pretty much in the pocket before the opening statements were over. That's how bad that case was. And if we can explicate it properly, maybe people will stop paying it less respect, except, of course, for Fred Goldman, who will live and die for that case and himself. I think I said on this show before, too, Fred Goldman ought to be really angry at the white supremacist, Mark Furman, who planted that glove and then led these detectives all around by the nose and the prosecution through most of that case. Most homicides in this country, if they're not caught in the act, the cops come out and have a press conference and say anybody out there that has seen something or heard something or look at all the cold cases, any little bit of information might help us. Well, in this case... Our timeline was built off of police reports. They went to these people, or these people came to the police first, the people on Bundy, said, here's what time I heard a dog bark. Here's what, here's what was happening. I was writing a letter on my computer. Here it was 1025. There was no dog barking. I'm right across the street. Uh, and so they could have eliminated who should be the number one suspect, which is always the husband or the ex-husband. That's your first one. You've got to eliminate him. And they could have done that real quick. But they had already jumped to the conclusion. Mark Furman shows them this glove, and they all go, hey, hey, we got him. And uh, they ignored all the Bundy people, okay? And they basically belittled them and humiliated them and messed with them on the witness stand. And 
Tom Lang, the cop, I'll at least give him credit that in his book, which I haven't read coast to coast or cover to cover, but at least he and Van Adder agreed with our timeline and fought with Darden and Clark because they went with a guy with a plaintiff whale of a dog, which is yeah, the biggest yes. load of shite I've ever heard in my life. That a plaintiff, but it hooked up for everybody. Oh, yeah, plaintiff whale of a dog. That's when the master was getting killed, 10 15. Well, as you know, Brian did a great job with Goldman's timeline. Ron Goldman does mm -hmm. not get to Bundy until 10 30, 10 33 at the best. Because uh, at the earliest, at, at the earliest, because he's at Metzaluna. He, you can look at all the testimony, which Brian lays out pretty nicely on his little website. But we never, you know, I wasn't looking at Goldman's timeline because I was looking at OJ's timeline at the time. But now it makes even more sense that ours was correct because Ron Goldman could not have been at Bundy at ten fifteen when a plaintiff whale of a dog who was heard by Pablo Fenez, who, by the way, wrote two screenplays to HBO, where both uh, scene one, take one, whatever, the plaintiff whale of a police siren could be heard in the distance. That's a little little catchphrase that was yeah, in a bit his. Odd. Yeah, and uh, oh, they all oh, they all went nuts. It's like, like, oh, Casey Anthony threw a baby in a swamp. Mm. Well, there's no evidence of that, but people sure will ride that pony for as long as they can to justify their conviction that they're right and people that work really hard on this case are wrong. And so uh, the one way, by the way, to shut up an OJ critic, well, there are two. And when people question me about the case, I say, have you read my website? It's 17,000 words explaining what the case was all about. If you haven't, don't waste my time by asking questions which you will realize are foolish if you do read the website. And the other thing I'd like you to think about is when you come back to ask me questions, you have a theory that would explain how O.J. Simpson could kill two people at 1035, go to the Bronco in the alley, come back again, as the FBI correctly says he did, run out again, get home, get rid of the clothes, the murder weapons, all the blood and everything else, and be at the limousine 10:55. That's 20 minutes, and the drive from her house to OJ's house is six miles, uh, and it usually took 20 minutes. But you could make it in 12 at 10 o'clock on a Sunday night. That still doesn't leave him time to do anything. That's the basis for eliminating suspects. The police were too hungry as a result of the bloody wars they had fought and lost over Rodney King and the cops who were acquitted in Simi Valley by a jury that was almost as nice as the Santa Monica jury that found against O.J. in the civil case, but then jailed in federal court for civil rights violations. This thing was a chance for them to get back on the right side of the law by prosecuting a rich guy, and they went like a bull in a china shop and ignored Almost everything I teach to investigators in the course that I do teach about how to conduct a criminal investigation. One of my best pupils, of course, is Patrick J. McKenna, who actually knew a lot about investigation before you ever met me. Well, and this is something I, I've mentioned many times on the show as well in regards to this. And, and this is uh, true, I think, for lots of high profile cases and, and even just regular, you know, where people will convince themselves that <clears throat> they know the answer, they, they, that it's this is what happened. And they will take that to such an extreme. And you see this with cops, you know, when, when uh, DNA evidence comes out and suddenly the, this uh, murderer that some cop put away for 35 years is actually innocent. And the cops will still, well, I still think he did it. You know, I mean, it, it, it's almost like a, I mean, that sort of goes to a deeper psychological problem, but it is again an issue because we see this more and more with criminal justice where people just simply, they don't want to believe what is actually true in front of them. And the OJ case is a, a sort of a perfect example of this. As you say, I mean, you, I've, I've used the, the, the timeline thing with, with friends and family that question me on this. And they're always sort of at the end, they're kind of left with this like, well, yeah, that makes sense, but, but you know, I, I still think he did it. You know, he still hit her. So, sure. so therefore, everything you said is null and void. Um, he did it. And that's this, this sort of deep, ingrained 
um, social problem. I think there's races involved in all of this, this sort of sense of, of moral right and wrong uh, and that people kind of carry with them. And that really kind of clouds your judgment and is a shame because we've become such a partisan sort of a society right now. Uh, and, and, you know, politically and socially and religiously and what have you, uh, the, the people are just sort of, um, it's, you know, they believe they are right and that's it. That's, that's the truth. That's the, you know, the last word that, that can be said on, on a topic like that. Um, uh, Lee, I think I would be remiss if I didn't ask you uh, that uh, since I've got you on the show right now, uh, and people will of course, uh, be familiar. Um, well, I mean with, uh, the, the most recent portrayal of you by uh, Nathan Lane. I, I'd love to get your take on uh, on that. But uh, tell us about the um, the actual the day when you were questioning Furman, when you you knew you you had him in this huge lie. Because of course you had the tapes from uh, Laura Hart McKinney, where Furman uses every possible oh, no. slur under no. the planet. No, stop right there. We didn't have the that's tapes. the biggest misconception. Conception in the world. I never finished cross-examining Furman because Ito interrupted me. And he ruled, which is very unusual and pretty unfair, that until the defense called the witnesses who claimed that Furman used bad language, mm. I could not question him about the incidents where those witnesses were the basis for the accusation. And so... He said, you may resume your cross when your witnesses have testified. I had 12 witnesses, including a judge from Texas, to whom Furman had said some awful things when she stopped just asking directions. Mm -hmm. Then Patrick found the case before the prosecution wound up. The minute the defense took over, or soon thereafter, we played the tapes in open court, and Judge Ito ruled them all out but two. I thought Johnny Cochran might go away for this one because he called a press conference in the parking lot outside his building. I was standing there and called Ito everything but a dirty crook for a ruling that was so biased in favor of the prosecution. Now, the jury was locked up. Sure, I have a notion they got to um, learn more about those tapes than the little two snippets played in open court. But I'll tell you an interesting thing. Much as I used to get the credit and for many years thereafter the blame for the Furman Cross, the fourth lady of the jury was talking to Pat at the Christmas party after the verdict, and Pat was trying to squeak a compliment out from her. By asking, uh, how did you guys like Mr. Bailey? She had excoriated Johnny Cochran for acting like a juvenile. It is, if it doesn't fit, you must have quit. And putting on the blue hat and all those good things. And she was an elegant lady, a deacon of the church. And she said, well, we like Mr. Bailey, but we didn't need Mr. Bailey. We knew Furman was a liar the minute he stood up. Uh, my whole objective was to catch Furman in a lie, flat, cold and then invoke the old argument, false in one thing, false in other or all things. And that's exactly what we accomplished. He didn't think that we could pull that off, and he took the chance of lying. And the disturbing thing is that when he said, I haven't used that word in 10 years, Marsha Clark, who was the lawyer that examined him, sat right there and knew very well he was committing perjury and did not take any steps to stop it. And in my view, even a criminal defense lawyer who knows his client is committing perjury has to do something about it before it governs the case. And that is one of the sorest spots in the whole Simpson case. And I suspect, Pat suspect, and I think was that much of the evidence that we proved to be false, they knew was false before it went on. They were the Vince Lombardi of the Los Angeles courtroom. Winning is not an important thing, said Vince. 
it is the only thing. Mm. And that's the track they follow. Well, and of course, too, I mean, you've, you've got uh, the uh, investigations into Furman uh, during the trial. Uh, I mean, the, the, his, him being a racist is sort of like this uh, dark secret is uh, patently false. Uh, and, you know, I mean, it's just like you as you said, uh, correct me there, you had 12 witnesses uh, who could uh, testify to this. Um, Lee, what was it like uh, uh, during that? Um, you know, was it just sort of business as usual? Um, you know, any, well, you know, what was it sort of like staring Furman down? Um, well, for one thing, I lean hard on lawyers who during a cross examination take their eyes off the witness because, and this was nicely done by Nathan Lane in the movie you mentioned, which substantively was a piece of junk, but the acting in it was superb. And I mm -hmm. think the awards that were given out, uh, Sarah Paulson and others were well-deserved. Um, Nathan Lane is a famous Broadway actor. And he went through the sequence that toppled Furman. And I could see it in his eyes. I knew he was done then, even though we had nothing but other witnesses who were all good, solid people to testify against him. And I said, <clears throat> after he denied vociferously ever using the N-word in the past 10 years prior to the date of his testimony, I said, so if anybody came into this courtroom and said they heard you use that, they would be lying, wouldn't they? And he took the bait. He said, yes. And I said, all of them? And he looked at me and suddenly realized for the first time we had an army of witnesses. <laughs> and he said, yes, all of them. But his eyes said he'd just been punched in the gut and hard. And after that, it was all downhill. The tapes were great because they made the point so that he couldn't deny it and to plead guilty, uh, but the, the tapes, it turned out, were not necessary. Matter of fact, we got very little out of the tapes for the jury to hear, and then Judge Ito turned around and said, well, you've got 12 witnesses here, I'll allow you three. And I said, why are you eliminating my witnesses? Um, and, you know, Furman has, has already uh, lied on the witness stand, I'm entitled to prove it. He said, well, you had the tapes, so you don't need so many witnesses. You talk about a bootstrap ruling. Mm -hmm. uh, I was rather angry, but I did not go out in the parking lot and call a press conference because I wasn't a California lawyer and certainly not as beloved as Johnny Cochran. Yeah, let me say something about the tapes real quick, if I could. Yeah, yeah, please, Pat. Go ahead. We never... We, I found those in July of 95. Lee crossed Furman March of 95. Okay, mm -hmm. so he had all of this stuff. Now, if we'd ever found those tapes, which we now know Furman's investigator, Pelicano, who's sitting in federal prison right now, had gone to Laura and asked her to destroy them. Um, if they didn't have those, do you think Marsha would have stood up in the closing argument, called him a racist? Do I hate him? Yes. She, they would have embraced him like they had done all the way up until the tapes were found. Even after he was crossed by Lee, crucified, they were out there trying to attack our witnesses, okay? And Lee was able to convince Ito, we didn't have to turn this discovery over until right before we call him. So we, we'd give five names uh, to Darden, for example. And there was one in particular, her name's Alwyn Martin. She's a white girl, was dating an African-American, got carjacked in some part of the city, was stabbed, repeatedly by a couple of white guys. Furman was the guy that came to the hospital. Furman's the guy that says, no, they, not that neighborhood, couldn't have been white, had to be Hispanic or black. That's just a little bit of her story. But the other thing was she was so traumatized by this that she was now living in a, in a home that had no utilities in her name, her driver's license didn't have her address on it. She was still fearful. The minute we showed Darden that name, there was media cameras on her porch. She called me because I've been dealing with her for months. I said, I'll, we'll keep your name protected as long as we can. If you, and she was going to come on the stand. And they were, <coughs> excuse me, all over her front doorstep, camera crews and everything. She called me in a panic. How did they get my name? And I, I realized, well, we gave 
your name to Chris Darden today because we were going to call you tomorrow. I don't think we called her. I don't think we ended up calling Alan Martin. No, she since has, has even talked about that in the press. But that's what they were doing. They would attack our people. They attacked the timeline people. Normally, Lang and his book and Van Adder say they agree with the timeline. So why would they then sit there while the prosecution's annihilating Denise Pilnack and, and the various witnesses from the timeline? Why are they attacking these people that said, hey, there's a murder across the street from my house. Let me go to the police. Uh, and so that's just, they were only trying to win. They weren't, there was never a search for any sort of justice here. They paraded, I think, 14 cops at one period in this trial to say, oh, Mark Furman, I, he was with me, then I gave him to Lee, and Lee gave him to, to uh, Corey, and down the road, and all the, they call all these cops one after another to say, there's no way Furman could have planted the glove. He was never alone. And then we find out late in the game when we uh, take the deposition of Ralph Rokar as the crime scene guy, that Furman was all alone with this guy at four in the morning, and he brings the guy from behind Bundy in the alley, say, come with me, brings him around, and takes that great picture you see of Furman pointing at the glove. Not at footsteps, not at melted ice cream, not at bloody fingerprints, nothing, not at the beeper, not at any, the one glove. That's what he's pointing at, that picture. Yeah, Just the other figure one that out. Pocket. Yeah. The other one he'd already put up at Rockingham, because now it's four in the morning. So he comes back and has the crime scene guy come take that one picture. The crime scene guy's scratching his head. Now, they fought us for the contact sheets all through that trial. It wasn't until late in the trial that we went and got his, de I think Peter Newfeld took his deposition. I was there. And they fought us. They had supervisors behind this guy. And they made us, they had to give us the contact sheets. We went right down the, I don't know if you know what contact sheets are, but yeah, if yeah. I took a picture of everybody in the room, there it'd be like a GPS nowadays, but it would have the sequence of your pictures and the times and all that. And so why would Furman have his picture taken at 4.30 in the morning pointing at and at one glove and nothing else. So those were just, to us, they're like bombshells. You know, we're going on and on and saying, Jesus, God, these people are outrageous out here. So that's what we fought with forever. And then we'd have a great day. Uh, we put on, I forget how many witnesses about the cut. Remember, he has a big cut on his finger. And we had people at the airport when he's getting ready to get on the plane. We had a pilot on the plane at Lee Cross. We had people in Chicago from Hertz that picked him up. There's never any cut on his finger. He cuts his finger in the hotel room in Chicago when he gets a call from Phillips that his wife's been slaughtered. I, I don't think they said slaughtered. Your wife's been killed. And he's freaking out, banging glasses. He knocked a lamp over. We had crime scene pictures of the hotel room, which even in his statement the next day, he says, I went a little bonkers last night which is probably an understatement because he's in a you know horrible situation with his, with his wife. His kids are at the police department. But um, none of that made it on TV that night. And Brian did a good job of looking at all the news reports that night. It, all the reports were about Ito had a problem with some juror. I forget what that problem was. And there was some other problem. Not one, not one report about, I don't know, six or eight witnesses that we put on in one day. Just forget about the other stuff they had to say, just about the cut on his finger. There was no cut on his finger. <clears throat> Excuse me, there's no trail of blood. Now it's claimed this trail of blood. Why is there no blood in the limousine? There's no blood in the airplane. There's no blood anywhere. Well, we are, we're at the break, and uh, we will be continuing the conversation in the second hour with Pat McKenna and Ethley Bailey. So uh, stay tuned because we've got lots more to talk about.
Oh, yes. I like very much radio. They're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high fructose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me in <laughs> American Freedom Radio. Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. I don't like words that hide the truth. I don't like words that conceal reality. I don't like euphemisms. And American English is loaded with euphemisms because Americans have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent a kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. I'll give you an example of that. When I was a little kid, if I got sick, they wanted me to go to the hospital and see the doctor. Now they want me to go to a health maintenance organization. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people. The government doesn't lie. It engages in disinformation. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part of it to us, do they? Never mention that part of it. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio in service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs, and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Control the all out. Control the all out. your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. War 
Hawkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything, geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. Uh, and uh, if you are joining us right now, we are joined uh, uh, by Pat McKenna and F. Lee Bailey, of course, two men who were intimately involved in the O.J. Simpson trial uh, and were d- fascinating conversation thus far. And I'm definitely going to uh, beg to get uh, the two of you back on. Uh, but uh, very quickly before we jump back into the interview, of course, if you enjoy this type of stuff, then I highly encourage you to go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redman and you can uh, join and uh, become a subscriber. Subscriber uh, for uh, you know as little as a dollar. Uh, you can give me more, of course, if you want to, and uh, you get access to uh, exclusive material. So uh, if you enjoy this kind of uh, uh, conversation and type of show, uh, definitely uh, you know go over there and uh, um, become a patron uh, today. But uh, anyway, as I said, um, we are uh, with Pat McKenna and Effie Bailey, and uh, we uh, we talked uh, uh, or mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, you guys are are working on a book uh, about the trial, and uh, I would say you know the, the OJ pr- probably like things like um, uh, not quite on the scale, but like JFK. You know, there's a million books about JFK, and there are certainly a lot of books about the OJ trial. I would say all of them, with the exception of uh, maybe Stephen Singular's book Legacy of Deception, are mostly uh, complete garbage and lies. Uh, Stephen's right. book to me is the only one that actually kind of stands up, and everything Stephen wrote is uh, totally true, and you know actually happened in mm-hmm. court and whatnot, um, and and came to pass, and and definitely uh, you know was uh, important to un- unraveling the whole case, uh, not only with Furman but EDTA and all that stuff, right. and uh, so I guess that you know the the sort of like silly. Uh, you know, question is um, uh, why? Why are you guys uh, dis- uh, writing a book? Why did you decide to write a book? Uh, and obviously, I mean, I, I can't wait to read it, and I think it's going to be um, a, a real treasure for people out there. But what made you guys decide to finally write a book? Well, very frankly, it was inspired in part by the reaction to the parole hearing um, that was conducted in July. And let me explain why I say that. I have in the past been inundated by inquiries from the press and requests for interviews and all that sort of thing on a number of cases. This case is now 23 years old. And during the two day period before the hearing, I did 17 separate TV shows, including all the networks for interviews about 19 radio stations and the number of interviews with print reporters. That tells me OJ is still very much alive. This is a case that won't die. The public, uh, at least segments of them, are all unsatisfied. But what I'm seeing is a new generation coming along. My generation, we have just given up on. Their minds are closed. If Jesus Christ came down and said, I want you to know Simpson uh, is going to my place because he didn't do it, they'd probably throw him out. (laughs) They are so adamant, so smug, because they heard snippets of people who were just terribly antagonistic to Simpson, and now they know more about the case than we do. Once again, and I, I say this to your listeners, I have a very thoroughly documented position paper, you can call it, it was a treatment for a book, frankly, uh, some years ago. On my website, which is baileyandelliot.com, and you can read the whole thing. It lays out all the evidence we had, plus some evidence we never got to put on because the jury was collapsing on us. And after that, most people come back and say, you know, I never knew that stuff. I'm changing my attitude. I've had no one come back with one exception. 
and say, well, I've read your paper and I still think he did it. And my reaction to that is, why do you think it? Who cares what you think? You weren't there. I didn't see you in L.A. all the time at the trial. And Pat and I were there. And why would we, after 23 years of taking a fair amount of abuse <laughs> for the O.J. debacle, be out plumping for him if we had the slightest indication that he was guilty? And believe me, we've been around a while. Between us, probably 100 years of experience. If O.J. Simpson did it, we would know it. And I certainly would not besmirch my good name, which is still pretty good in many quadrants, <laughs> by getting out and plumping for a guy I knew to be a killer, even a much less brutal killer than this one. Now, of course, the tragedy is the corollary of any, every wrongful accusation and trial, conviction or no, is that the guilty party is given a pass. And that's exactly what the LA cops did here, caring about themselves, not about justice, not about their job, not even about their oaths. They put together a BS case about this guy and couldn't sell it to a jury, which did not get the benefit of all the blabber mouths and flannel mouths that sometimes infest the media, particularly at the lower echelons. So uh, they just cobbled together what they could best get. He got acquitted, but in the eye of public opinion, the worst case I have ever seen, he was convicted. And of course, the simple case, which is a whole other story, um, adds fuel to that fire. But it is a tragedy and one that I feel as long as I don't contact Alzheimer's or something else disabling, and Pat does as well, because we're not writing this book expecting to make a fortune. We're writing this book to ram it down the public's throat until they understand what really happened. Those that will listen, the oncoming generation for whom all those interviews were done gives us hope, light at the end of the tunnel, that if we do a good, thoroughly documented job in telling the whole truth about the Simpson case, this coming generation will recognize it and say, well, my dad was full of BS on some other issues, and apparently <laughs> he was wrong about Simpson, too. Uh, Pat, anything you want to add there? No, same stuff. Uh, we've talked over the years about a book. I've had a million people say, oh, you ought to write a book. <laughs> I even told OJ this prior to the Vegas thing. I said, do you know this story? No one's going to listen to this story until we're all dead. I was wrong. We're still all alive. And now we, like Lee says, we have a generation. I, mean, I speak to a law school, younger kids. They're on the edge of their seats by the time we're done. They go, that's not, I didn't, what, well, what about this? And what about that? And you show them that that was BS or some, you know, whatever the specific thing might be. Um, and the people start perking up. Uh, and so I just think we might have some intelligent people that don't think like sheep, even though this day and age, geez, you look at what's on the on television and stuff, you think, God, is everybody crazy except us? Uh, it, there's no, there's no decent discourse anymore. It's like this country's like one big, large Jerry Springer show. If you bring up politics, yeah, exactly. and so, anyways, not so we're not speaking politics. We're speaking about a pretty simple case, like Lee said earlier. This is a murder trial. Should have taken three to four weeks tops, tops. They had this thing strung out for over ten months, and I used to scratch my head and say. Well, we're kicking their ass, so the people ought to be seeing that this is obviously uh, an innocent man, and the only ones that were really paying attention from from the time the co court started until it ended at the end of the day were the jurors that were sequestered, like Lisa's, couldn't watch all this crap on TV or what was in the papers, and they took an oath to listen to what came out of the, off that witness stand, and they um, delivered on their oath. They delivered, by the way in about one hour. As we track it back and look at the time that they came out to ask for testimony, they walked out in the middle of it and called for the verdict forms. And I knew then that 
had in hand. Of course, the press went out and told everybody it's a conviction for sure. And Robert Shapiro did the same thing and tricked Alan Dershowitz into echoing what he said. Alan said he was cautiously pessimistic. But I want to pick up on something that echoed that I had said earlier. This case was a trial that never should have gone more than three months. Within weeks of the verdict in the OJ case, I was in Denver at a seminar for criminal defense lawyers, and one of the speakers in the program with me was Judge Richard Mache, who was best known for having convicted the Oklahoma City bomber McVeigh and sentenced him to death. And he's uh, a tough guy, but a good judge. He's the kind I like to have on the bench. He runs his courtroom, but if he sees that you know what you're doing, he lets you try your case. He wore his cowboy boots and his Stetson hat to court every day. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, Judge, if this had been you, first I said, Judge, where were you when we needed you? Because <laughs> this is needed a strong judge in the worst way, not a guy whose wife was a senior woman in the LAPD who had himself been a prosecutor and really uh, then became, in my view, too fascinated with the nightly news to my good rulings, which got worse as we went along. I said to Judge Mage, if you had been presiding in this trial, how long would it have been before you put the first lawyer in jail mm -hmm. for diarrhea of the mouth? And he said, three weeks. That's the kind of guy the O.J. case was missing. Oh, uh, sir, Ito definitely sort of uh, seemed to fall in love with this sort of cult of celebrity and the the sort of Hollywood aspect of all of this. Uh, and of course, no, I mean he is he is you know he is a celebrity in his own right as Judge Ito, the the judge of the O.J. case. I mean that's how people remember him. That that is his legacy ultimately. Um, you um you, you mentioned uh, brief a little bit. You know, you've got some new stuff. Is there in that'll be in the book? Is there anything you can kind of tease out? I don't want to give anything away. Obviously, I, we want the listeners to go out and and buy a copy of the book when it's published. But anything you can kind of uh, hint to us uh, that that uh, it might be new to people, uh, even people that are are fairly well versed in the case. Yeah, um, we have a lot that has never been aired in the sense of mass exposure to people. Bear in mind, this, this case shut down because having started with 24 jurors, you know, had gotten rid of 10 of them with rulings that we thought were horribly prejudicial because the ones that he kicked off the jury were people that we had counted on to find a reasonable doubt. We got down to 14, one was 73, which in my view was old at the time. I was 61. And the other was having chest pains. He was in his late 30s. If they went, that would be 12. If Ido can one more juror without the consent of the prosecution, we could not go forward. Uh, OJ was nearly bankrupt. He almost bankrupted the Cochran firm. Uh, thank goodness for its resilience. And we could not afford a mistrial. This was in August of 95. <clears throat> we asked Marsha to step in the lobby. We queried whether or not she would agree to go with less than 12 in a non-capital case. The parties can do that. You can go as low as six and still hold the trial together. She says, not on your life. I will demand a mistrial. Now, here is a lawyer who knew she had lost her case. There's no question about it. When Mark Furman went down, and I'm sure the jurors knew he pleaded guilty to perjury, which is no surprise to most of them, that opened a wound in Marsha and never saw it heal. Her bravado, her uh, walking on slippers, so to speak, as a woman who had a big case in the bag, because for a time she probably believed she could win it. But when Furman came apart, she knew that wasn't so. He was, after all, the only linkage or possible linkage to the club. And so she wanted out. 
That left us with a whole bunch of good evidence, including O.J.'s testimony, which we desperately wanted the public to hear. He's a very good witness most of the time. And we had him pretty well trained up to do a good job in the witness stand and some other devastating witnesses. And we had to forego all of those, including perhaps the most important other than OJ, the guy that probably saw the killers, two of them, maybe three, talking to Nicole on the sidewalk at the corner next to her house. We never got a chance to call him because we had to close down the case while we still had a jury of 12 or go home with no result and leave our client in jail until a retrial could take place much, much later. This was a grisly choice to make. The left out portion of the defense, which I wanted to pursue, because my experience is when you defend a celebrity, a reasonable doubt is not enough. You need to convince the public they didn't do it or they will never get whatever career they had back or good name or anything else on the positive side. And I desperately wanted to put these people on. I had an argument with Johnny Cochran about the witness I just mentioned. Um, and <clears throat> I had to admit that he had a point he couldn't afford to do a retrial. Frankly, neither uh, could I, because Shapiro had arranged it so I never got paid a nickel, even my expenses, for being in the trial. And so, and we knew we had it won. At least I did. And so I couldn't keep the argument going, but it broke my heart. And I suspected that we were not going to be the better for it. But I never, never anticipated that having a jury there rendered in an hour after a nine-month trial, America would arrogate to itself the right to be a super jury and say they were wrong, even though these poor people had been locked up for nine months with little to do but listen to the evidence in the Simpson case. That was a huge insult by a callous bunch of people whom I don't like. Mm. I <laughs> so, so much just uh, to, to to say just uh, simply on that, but yeah, I mean, again, the way the this uh, jury has been uh, so vilified in the uh, not even just in the media, I mean, like in the American consciousness, you know, I mean, they are evil. They they were they were in on it, you know. Um, all of that uh, is, is there anything uh, uh, new in the book vis-a-vis uh, -vis Mark Furman? I mean, he's such a he's he was sort of my introduction to much of this case. Of course, was uh, began looking into Mark Furman and, and his background and stuff. Uh, anything new in that, or uh, uh, you know, or, or, or simply, can we expect that you're going to actually give the the full sort of honest truth about uh, this neo-Nazi cop that uh, somehow uh, through delusions of grandeur and whatnot? Uh, inserted himself into this huge trial and was ultimately, you know, um, the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest reason that, uh, you know, O.J. was acquitted because of this guy planting evidence and whatnot. Uh, anything uh, diff new on Mark Furman or, or anything like that? Well, there is one big chunk that has been alluded to in the press, but we couldn't get into evidence. That's why he... Ito imposed the 10-year rule to limit my cross on the use of racial slurs. That's because 11 years before the trial, Mark Furman had sued the state of California, claiming that he had become so radicalized against minorities that he was no longer able to be a good police officer, and he wanted the city to allow him to retire and give him a full pension, and Mark was 40-ish at the time. Ido ruled that suit was too stale to be admitted, which was not a very good legal ruling, but he made it. We were stuck with it, and most of the public has no idea that in addition to the fact that this guy hated, he hated Jews worse. He had his favorite book on his mantelpiece called Mein Kampf, and he 
the tree uh, at Christmas time with only stainless steel swastikas. So there are a lot of reasons to dislike Mark even more thoroughly for those who are not rednecks and in love with him. And uh, we'll certainly add some fuel to that. When we say new, we don't mean recently discovered. Mm. We mean never publicized so that the public generally would have access to it. And uh, one other thing on the book, too, I mean, is, uh, it, I mean, this is maybe, again, a silly question, but uh, are you going to have a particular focus on the book? For instance, uh, you know, like uh, who actually did it or something like that. I mean, I mean, it, it does feel as if the boat might have sailed on actually solving the the murder, you know, who the murderers are. Obviously, they've been able to skirt the law uh, this far, and certainly they, they must have some friends in high places if they're able to do this. But uh, any any sort of uh, um, progress in, in that sort of a realm, or is this really more, like you said, I mean, about presenting the case as it actually unfolded and not the way that, you know, CNN and Greta Van Susteren sort of cut it up for people? Well, uh, the FBI concluded very shortly after the murders that Pay Resnick owed a lot of money to some Colombians for cocaine, 30,000 is the figure that was bandied about, and that she was ordered assassinated as an example of what happens to people who don't pay, since drug dealers can't very well go to court <laughs> and bring a lawsuit to collect their debts. Um, Pay Resnick left Nicole's residence where she had been staying a day or two before the murder was committed to, with her own consent, I think, to a drying out place. Daniel Freeman Hospital in uh, Marina Del Rey. Yeah. A secure facility. I think that the, and we think Colombian or Cuban assassins, mostly because of the nature of the wound, I think whoever did it simply mistook Nicole, a blonde woman, for, um, her friend, also a blonde woman, and they killed her essentially by mistake. Now, the best information we could ever get through our law enforcement friends off the record was that the assassins, when it was discovered, the enormity of their error, the heat they were bringing uh, on the drug trade because there was concern that Faye Resnick's situation would pop to the fore that the killers were executed for their stupidity. So when you say chance of solving the case, yes, you're right, but let me tell you something. When the cops make a mistake and they later discover that they've made a mistake, they will go, many of them, great distances to cover it up. And covering up is an American pastime that has brought down President Nixon, almost brought down Reagan, except he was senile by the time it was discovered. And <clears throat> it's, it's just something people cannot learn not to do. If the police discovered, well, they've got Simpson in custody, that this guy from Cartagena knocked off, well, I mean, uh, Nicole and... Goldman, who just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, as all the evidence suggests, they would have immediately killed whoever gave them the information or done something to him so that it could not surface. Because having arrested an otherwise prominent and really much beloved citizen like OJ and then turning around and saying, oh, after all the things we said about him, it turns out he didn't do it, uh, a lot of heads would have rolled on that. That's not what the police do. Indeed, he was driven home to me early in my career. I was in Cleveland trying to find a way to get Dr. Sam Shepard out of jail after seven years of service for a wrongful conviction. And a lieutenant detective in Cleveland said to me, Mr. Bailey, if Sam Shepard is innocent, I don't want to know it. And that attitude pervades the police thinking because they're very sensitive to press credit. They badly needed and wanted press credit at the time all of this came about. And they would do, I think, anything 
to prevent any alternative facts from coming out, even if they were solid truth. That's a harsh thing to say. But this is the harsh world, and the law enforcement can be very harsh indeed as a consequence of any serious threat of embarrassment. That's just the way life is. It's been that way for as long as I've been aware of badges and defenses and criminals. And there always seems to be, especially with this case, uh, the more you look into it historically, you know, every avenue that uh, should have been explored, like, say, cocaine and and particularly large amounts of cocaine, you know, coke trafficking and stuff, uh, were just simply, uh, you know, they, they just sort of turned a blind eye or refused to, to look into it or any of the other uh, strange murders that took place just before and just after uh, Nicole and Ronald were killed that uh, seemed to have at least, uh, at the at the very least, a tangential connection, if not a deeper connection, of course, never, uh, you know, were just, again, just uh, uh, overlooked or, or ignored, uh, um, uh, which, of course, sort of, uh, you know, seems to be, to me, and, and I'm not a, an investigator, you know, at all, or I'm not licensed or anything like that, but those seem to be just so blatantly uh, obvious that you should be looking into these things, um, and, and yet nobody was doing that uh, with this case. And uh, I know you you were uh, you sent me an email the other day saying that uh, in along with working on this book, you're also working on a school to train people in investigation. So tell us about that as well. Well, for many years, I have been complaining that a great many uh, people who style themselves as trial lawyers really have no special training in the field and that we should offer some that law schools don't on the mechanics of facting, not lawyering, but facting because lawyering or looking up the law is pretty much done now by Westlaw, Google. Mm. You could become a legal research people, a person with a couple days of training but being able to handle evidence, to turn facts into evidence or information, you know, these are subjects that aren't taught. So I said we ought to have a school for trial lawyers like the one in England, where everybody who wants to be a courtroom lawyer has to be specially trained after law school. What you have right now is if you had a brain tumor, a CAT scan showed that you were operable, if we analogize to medicine, you would have to pick which general practitioner you wanted. Now, there are a lot of superstars out there, and they have joined me in the proposal that yes, this kind of training needs to be formalized, brought into a classroom, but taught by real live trial lawyers. We are over the first threshold. Duquesne Law School in Pittsburgh uh, one of the better ones in the country, has agreed to host for beginners a two-week course called Top Shelf Trial Lawyers um, or Advanced Trial Lawyers. We haven't fastened on a final name, but that's the notion that there weren't so much shooting in this country. I would espouse calling it Top Gun. But they all point in the same direction. Here's a guy with special training, knows what he's doing. So that if you have a brain tumor, you can find a neurosurgeon who operates on the brain and not entrusted to your general practitioner. Pat is going to be on the faculty of the school with another prominent private investigator because I am a great disciple of the notion that if your investigator is good enough, most any lawyer will do. And while that is a bit of hyperbole, um, because someone has got to use the fruits of the investigative work, it nonetheless has a lot of teeth in it, and no lawyer is any better in the courtroom than the state of his preparation, and preparation means um, on the hoof, investigators, boots on the ground, getting out and digging, talking to people, looking under stones, and so forth, and they, people of that caliber who really know what they're doing, and particularly who know how to get witnesses to talk to them even though they don't have a badge, which many do not. Mm. 
those people are even smaller in number than good trial lawyers. So we're trying to give an injection to both professions. And I'm happy to say that as of the moment, we're getting tremendous support from two of the biggest lawyer organizations in the country that actually do have a lot of genuine trial lawyers in their ranks. One of the reasons that I'm in John Romano's office here in West Palm today is because John is the point man for the National Trial Lawyers Association, which has pledged to jump in and give support to the school. I think it's going to be an exciting school in a way. I kind of hope it can be a legacy because I have been plumping for it for, for over 50 years. And now it might come to fruition before I go to fruition. <laughs> Well, no, and I, I mean, I would uh, only uh, just sort of echo and repeat what you were saying there. I think this is something that um, is uh, much needed. And again, as we, we see the uh, the way that, um, again, celebrity and uh, Hollywood and stuff sort of presents uh, trials and trial lawyers and, you know, people think it's like an episode of Law and Order where in an hour everything is solved and, and sort of tied up uh, in a nice bow. Uh, and uh, that's not really quite how it works. And I mean, there seems to be this sort of um, crappier and crappier sort of uh, level to which uh, the you know the criminal justice system really works for people. Um, Pat, on the, uh, the this again, you're going to be uh, uh, teaching people in investigation and stuff. And this is sort of a, a bit of a broader question, but I mean, um, I'm sure you see all the time, and you've obviously been involved in cases where uh, you know. Uh, Joe Schmo considers himself an expert on, uh, you know, a case that you worked on and, and sort of acts as if the, they are a private investigator or something like that. I mean, what do you make of that, this sort of trend more and more with, you know, these uh, YouTube armchair investigators? And uh, what, what, would, what do you see as a sort of big problem with that that you would be sort of remedying uh, as a, an instructor in the school? Well, I mean, the principles of what I do um, doesn't matter what I've done in the past. It's what I do tomorrow. If you hire me tomorrow, it doesn't do you any good if I screw it up. I don't rest on laurels of the various cases over the years. You have to grind it. That What I try to tell investigators is you really have to grind it out more than in the old days because, for example, here in Florida, <clears throat> we have public records laws that are, are pretty good. So I had a case recently where Three different ways I asked for police reports from this certain agency, right? And uh, then I went back a different way. And then there was a lady with the back to me saying, well, you can't have those. First, I said for four times, we don't have those records. And then I hear a lady that sees me for the umpteenth time coming to the front desk at the police department and getting out, aggravated with me. She said, you don't have, you can't have those till after the trial. And it was specific stuff I was looking at. I was holding the phone records up. I pointed to the phone in her front desk, and I said, well, they won't do me any good after the uh, trial. So I went back to the lawyers, prepared an affidavit of what I found out that a defense lawyer called the prosecutor. She goes, I had no idea. She gets on the phone, calls him, what, what is the story on this? And then they produce these records. Well, it dawns on me that what cops can do now to protect, quote, their bosses, the prosecutors, of having to turn over Brady material or, or, or something exculpatory to the defense they don't share it with the prosecutor. That way, when the lawyers are talking to each other and the uh, defense lawyers are talking to the prosecutor, she, you know, she doesn't he or she doesn't have anything to turn over. All right, I've turned everything over. Well, it turns out you turned everything you had over, but the cops didn't give you this stuff anyway. It just it it's how I do my work. I just. Uh, I save when they say we don't have the records. I save it. I have a house full of paper, <coughs> an office full of paperwork and stuff because I don't throw it out because I know maybe down the road that's going to help me. And in that one case, it did because I had four different sets of requests by me and they write on my request how many pages and what it cost me. And I had all that lined up. And it was just, thank God, the case lasted three years. And I made one more run at it, and lo and behold, I find a little report that leads to a name that leads to another name, and the prosecutor ended up dro uh, not dropping the case, but cut a deal with our client that saved him from prison. 
and uh, even though we think he was innocent. But it's those kind of things I have to tell other investigators about. And if you want to go on TV and say, I did this case and that case and all that, good for you, I guess. Uh, you don't do the profession any good. Um, crew. And a lot of investigation. And it's not just grinding and digging out the paperwork. You have to use your head for something besides a hat rack. How does this fit with our defense, for example? Or why does this not make sense? You follow me? Like, why does... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, for example, in the Furman case, you know, on the tapes he's talking about, <clears throat> without this case, I mean, without the glove, the case goes bye-bye. Well, this is July after the murders and all that, but it's so early. How does he know that without the glove, the case goes bye-bye? He must know something nobody else knows, because what if the so-called uh, bloody gloves and knives and all that show up in a vehicle in a garage that OJ owns, like in the Aaron Hernandez case. So how does Furman know early on that without these gloves, the case goes bye-bye? So those are things as an investigator, look at that and go, well, now, well, how does he know that? How does he, he must know something that we don't know. And he knows that he stuck the glove there. Well, he and knows. He can't get out of the, they can't kick him out of the case. He knows that the blood on the glove belongs to the two murder victims. Yeah. What he doesn't know is that the tests on the glove were not run until October, and he made these statements in July. So he had other reasons to know what kind of blood was on the glove, which can only be that he picked the glove up at the murder scene, put it in a plastic bag where it stayed overnight, and at 6 in the morning he discovered it, and it was still wet. Had it not been in a baggie or a Ziploc, it would have dried in two to three hours, and Pat and I stayed up one whole night to prove that, duplicating one year to the day after the murders at the same scene. What happens to two gloves, one in a bag and one not? If they're there by 11 o'clock, bear in mind, O.J. got in the limousine at 10.55, and they're not discovered until about six o'clock, which is when Furman runs in and tells the other detectives there's something out here that you ought to see. I mean, a thinking person who is not already drunk with the idea that I know Simpson did it, even if I don't know how or why, would say the evidence that Furman planted that glove not to frame O.J., he had no idea what O.J. was. He could have been in jail, which is considered a pretty good alibi in this business. It was to keep himself in the case because he had just been dismissed as too inexperienced to handle this front page case. And the old super detective geezers had taken over and they were forcing him out until he became an essential witness. And that was his only role in the case. Once the blood was found and people realized, my Lord, this is enough to tie Simpson in. They had nothing else. And in a properly orchestrated trial, it would have been a directed verdict after two months of courtroom work. Well, and that also speaks to uh, the, uh, um, the psychological reports that Furman gave with the police psychologist um, back, I don't know how many years back this was, but, you know, always talking about how he wanted this big case and he, you know, he, he was going to make it and this was going to sort of uh, develop his career. And you can kind of see the sort of uh, when you start piecing together that night where Furman is, you know, hopping fences and finding blood, uh, you know, little specks on, on the Bronco and whatnot. You can just sort of see him beginning to kind of, uh, this is it. This is my moment in the sun. This is what's going to make me into a legend. Uh, and again, these sort of delusions of grandeur with this guy. Uh, and, and, and again, I mean, the hubris of him, uh, like you were saying, Lee, when he's lying to your face and he knows he's, you know, he knows you, you know that he's uh, caught himself in a lie, but yet he still just kind of continues on. Uh, I would assume because he thought he was untouchable, uh, given uh, many of the things he got away with in the past. Um, 
I, you know, I we meant or Lee, you mentioned this earlier. I think in uh, the very beginning of the show, you know, the sort of alternative facts uh, and and uh, th- this uh, rhetoric that has become more and more popular under uh, the you know the great one Donald Trump. Uh, and uh, indeed, there were in this rise of of fake news, whatever that really means, and extreme partisanship and things like that. Uh, and undoubtedly, that is affecting us in all sorts of ways. But how do you think that's affecting us uh, in terms of the way we view criminal justice? Because I I do see this, um, you know, there's this, again, this rise of uh, true crime documentaries, many of which I I have serious issues with. Um, But how do you see uh, the the sort of uh, social fabric of of society right now, how that is affecting the way we view criminal justice? And I mentioned this many times now that we were talking, but I mean, we're in this celebrity obsessed culture and Hollywood obsessed culture uh, where we believe, you know, that, again, law and order is how crimes are solved. Is is that only getting worse or, uh, you know, is there is there light at the end of the tunnel with this? Um, I have a two part answer for that. Years ago, when I was young, there was only one law and order show that was chronically on television. Everybody followed it. It was a character named Perry Mason, Mm. who won every single case without ever getting a jury verdict. And his author, his parent, was Earl Stanley Gardner, uh, a crime fiction writer of the Times. And some of the plots were almost plural, but the defense always won. Then came CSI, which originally was a show about Las Vegas, has since emanated to New York, Miami, et cetera, and its many progeny, like NCIS and all of the others. And the public became fascinated with forensic evidence, detective work, law and order, which is certainly in that group, to the point where a jury would come out of a trial and say, well, where was the, where was the uh, uh, DNA in that case? We didn't hear any DNA. Well, DNA may have been <laughs> relevant to nothing in the entire case, but they had the bug from CSI, and so notly, suddenly they're armchair detectives. The shock of the Simpson verdict on many who were led to believe that it would go the other way became an aftershock. And for months, and I guess I could say years, it became much harder to win a defense verdict because jurors didn't want to be called stupid. And that's what the press said about the Simpson jury. And so is this uh, only sort of uh, becoming more and more of a problem? I mean, because, uh, again, I, I know what you mean. The, the CSI thing is just perfect. Where people are like, you know, where's the fingerprints? Where's this? Uh, or they assume that a trial works like CSI in that, you know, if, I don't know, if some, something happens, uh, they can, you know, do all sorts of crazy computer stuff and, and uh, you know, figure out the kill. You know, and I'll note, too, on that, th- this note of, of forensic evidence and stuff, you know, the, the Bruno Mali shoes, these, like, footprints, that are, uh, which have been, you know, pointed to as supposedly evidence uh, that o- o- O.J. was there and, and committed the murders. I mean, it's it's now come to light that shoe print analysis is not, It's not like a fingerprint or DNA. And there's actually quite a bit of sort of guesswork involved. Um, And, you know, the people that are really good at shoe print analysis are people that have done it for a while, but they are sort of, uh, you know, making assumptions and things like that. So, again, you know, uh, uh, jump in. Bear in mind, they had very good shoe prints. And the difference between a print or your impression is whether or not it's two or three dimensional. If it's in mud, it's an, uh, a foot impression. If it is on a flat surface like tile, it will be a print. There never was a print of any Bruno Mali shoes to compare to the ones that led to and from the crime scene. But those prints showed, and I cross examined the FBI agent who wrote the book on footprints and shoe prints. I cross-examined him, and there was no question, and he admitted that whoever had left the first set of Bruno Mali prints in bloodstains 
on the walkway and the steps, came back to the scene, stepped in the blood again, and walked away again. And you can see the prints fading as the culprit gets away from the scene. Those prints were never identified with any pair of shoes, only that they appeared to be of the Bruno Mali genre or the knockoff that you mentioned, Leon. And also, uh, none uh, or not uh, none, but uh, several of the detectives at the crime scene their 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 shoe prints were never uh, you know they they were never photographed or anything. That is correct, right? No, it, it took a, a what a month before they rounded them all up to come in and say, "Are they, bring in the shoes you were wearing." I think I read mm. that. Somewhere. Um, we never heard anything. About we never them. heard it from them. We just hear it later on that that's that's what happened. Right, you know, take our word for it, guys. Right. Yeah. Uh, look at the, look at the. If you remember the hair and fiber guy, Doug Diedrich, oh. everything was a match. He tried to say bent over, everything's a match. Now he's one of the leading authors on a, a on an article about how unreliable hair and fiber analysis is. Do you remember? Everything was rare in OJ. There were rare gloves, rare <laughs> freaking fibers, rare hairs. Everything was rare. Uh, rare carpet fibers. That's my favorite one. So O.J. Simpson, who the Hertz Corporation gives a Bronco to every other year, ends up getting a Bronco with rare carpet fiber in it. So that means that the company, that uh, the Ford company, makes a special car for Hertz to give to O.J. and puts in rare carpets. I mean, it's laughable. This rare matches and and hairs and fibers and all that sort of stuff. And rare isotoner gloves, for Christ's sakes, there was 9 million pairs of isotoners <laughs> made that year. Uh, it's worth uh, pausing for a minute to discuss Doug Diedrich. He was the FBI's top guy in hair and fibers. Hair and fibers can never and could not in those days be the subject of a match. All you could say is they're similar, compatible with, and so forth. And hair and fiber comparison is taught by taking two fibers, one known and one suspect from the crime scene, uh, so to speak, and butt-ending them and photographing them and blowing them way up. That was taught in every school Diedrich ever taught down at Quantico for the FBI, but he did not do it in this case. And the reason he didn't do it, I'm pretty sure, is because he knew the butt-ends wouldn't look good together. But Diedrich was my witness. He was known to be a bit of a grandstander. And so I thought I would explore through my network of defense colleagues some of his past work. I got transcripts of seven prior trials, one of them way up in Alaska. In each one of those trials, he told the jury he had done 10,000 cases. <laughs> and they spanned a period of 11 years. And I said, well, Mr. Diedrich, you haven't done a case, apparently, in 11 years, because you've done 10,000 then, and that's all you've done now. And I showed him the transcripts. After he got off the stand, he came up to me, he said, you know, nobody ever did that to me before. And I said, well, from the record, they should have. Right, <laughs> Uh, well, that seems like you know a lot of a lot of the people, some of these witnesses, uh, you know, were just sort of uh, taken aback by some of the you know the questioning and really kind of diving into that and you know this weird sort of I don't know code of silence uh, amongst uh, uh, all sorts of investigators and police officers and you know it's like you, you don't ask those those uh, sorts of questions on the stand. Um, well, we we are we're fast running out of time. I think we've got maybe I don't know five ten minutes left. So. Um, is there anything you guys want to uh, just sort of leave the listeners with? Anything that uh, maybe I didn't uh, um, uh, get to that you wanted to talk about? And then again, uh, do let us know, uh, Lee, especially where we can go to find uh, your work and uh, uh, and uh, any uh, uh, you know rough date for when the book comes out. Well, we're trying to get a book on the streets by next spring. I have not yet chosen a publisher. I will do that pretty promptly, I hope. But four of us are working on it. Pat and I, and the lawyer I mentioned, Bob Blazier, and a professional writer with whom I've worked a great deal in the past, who incidentally just finished a book on Judge Gorsuch, which will be out in January. 
and I think it's generally uh, favorable. But uh, I am simply hoping that people who listen to this program and others that we're able to do in the same genre will be moved to say, gee, if I had a firm opinion in this case, maybe it's worth another look. One of the singular things about this book, which should be comforting to those who are somewhat torn, is that we will end note it vociferously. But instead of having to look at the bottom of the page and interrupt your thinking and reading, end notes, of course, are found at the end of the work. These end notes will give you only a smatter of information because they will direct you to a website where we will have published and available for public inspection and reference all of the transcripts of both trials, criminal and civil, all of the documents that were received in evidence, if they were of any moment whatsoever. Some are routine, uncontested, and surplusage. But because to publish all of this material to prove that our contentions are well-founded in the book would involve a truckload of paper for each volume. Uh, the web becomes extremely handy as a repository on which to post for public viewing of those who care a little and want to look into the supporting evidence. And they can get it at rather quickly. Uh, most everybody except Pat McKenna knows how to turn on a computer <laughs> these days. However, uh, <clears throat> if we turn some of the people around, but particularly a big chunk of those in the millennial generation that believe they have an impression because dad told them so that Simpson did it, even though they're not quite sure why, if they will dive into it, as I have asked them to dive into my website uh, um, treatise, uh, Bailey and Elliot, all one word, no punctuation, lowercase, dot com. They'll find the whole thing laid out there. And it's called 10 Reasons Why the Jury Verdict Was Right. But it also involves a memorandum I wrote before the trial started, saying here's what the truth is and here's how we're going to go about proving that O.J. didn't do it and somebody else did. And that, to lawyers at least, will be of great interest because... We all know that a statement can be charged as having been recently made up. But if you lay that charge on somebody, he has the right to prove, no, I made the statement 10 years ago, and here it is on videotape or in writing or in a courtroom or somewhere. And it, it completely knocks down the notion of recent contrivance. Because lawyers, sometimes cases they have won and cases they have lost, get infected with Monday morning quarterbacking. And in retrospect, they realized what a brilliant job they did. And to me, the next question is, show me that your brilliance was cast in stone before you heard the other guy's evidence. And it will make you a much more respectable lawyer, and some do, and some don't. Well, excellent. And uh, again, it's uh, your website uh, for everybody out there, and it'll be linked up in the show notes, is baileyandelliot.com. Um, Pat, if anyone's looking for a private investigator, you want to uh, plug uh, plug yourself there, please do. Well, I'm in the phone book, and uh, <laughs> I'm pretty easy to find, trust me. Uh, Let me carry that a step further. <laughs> you can reach him at PJMPI on AOL. Yeah. Well, thank you, uh, F. Lee Bailey and Pat McKenna, for coming on the show. I will definitely be getting you guys back on, hopefully soon, and definitely when this uh, book comes out. So thank you all for listening. Of course, if you want to support me, you can go to Patreon, and I will be coming to you uh, next week. But until then, uh, I'll be talking to you soon.
No rules. No rules. No taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are. American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high food dose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. And I hope people support American Freedom Radio. And I hope people vote with their dollars and really understand the value of having American Freedom Radio. Because that's my family. If you love me at all, Jack Blood, support American Freedom Radio. Like, my family has literally disowned me. (laughs) American Freedom Radio, Danny and Don and those guys, those are my actual family. So please, please support these guys because they have all the technology. They have all these great things that they're going to do. But obviously, they can't do it all by themselves. So not only would I like to see you support them, I'd like to see you retweet them and repost them and really get involved and get on the the bandwagon, so to speak, on doing that do-it-yourself promotion because they're a do-it-yourself radio network and, uh, and we just need that so much. Assassination. You know what's interesting about assassination? Well, not only does it change those popularity polls in a big hurry, but it's also interesting to notice who it is we assassinate. Do you ever notice who it is? Stop to think of who it is we kill. It's always people who've told us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon. They all said, try to live together peacefully. Bam! Right in the head. Apparently we're not ready for that. Yeah, that's difficult behavior for us. We're too busy thinking around, sitting around trying to think up ways to kill each other. Here's one we came up with. It's efficient, too. Genocide, you know? Killing large numbers of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they don't have the same kind of hats you do. <laughs> you ever notice that any time you see two groups of people who really hate each other, chances are good they're wearing different kind of hats. <laughs> Keep an eye on that, it might be important. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Lead control of the all out. Radio. 